All right, good morning. I hope you all are doing well, had a good weekend, uh, stuff like that. Uh, thank you for your midterm exams, I appreciate it. Uh, I will start grading them, and I hope to have those back by Thursday. Uh, today I will be returning your other work from last week, like the exam prep and the lab we did, so uh, thanks for being a little patient here with me, I appreciate it. What we're going to do today is we're going to start off and do some lecturing over chapters 10, which we're in right now, and also chapter 11. Uh, Wednesday, when you come to class, turn in the molar mass volatile liquid online lab. You can do it either uh, paper, turn it in the paper, or if you want, you can email it. Either way is fine. Um, Wednesday morning, we'll also talk about problem set number four. Problem set number four is over the gas law stuff we did last week. People usually do pretty good on that kind of stuff. It's a little bit of a refresher for the stuff we've done in Chem 221 as well, but it should be cool. And then also on Wednesday, we'll actually have an actual lab. Woohoo! Um, it has a long name, so I abbreviated it as linear regression and crystals. And that's kind of the focus of this lab. And there's two parts to this lab. Um, we're going to start using a linear regression analysis which is just a math tool you can use to get sense out of your data. It's not a hard process, but I will tell you right now, you kind of need a computer version of uh, Google Sheets or Apple's Numbers or Microsoft Excel, all right? The phone versions just don't cut it, uh, nor does the Microsoft 365, just like that. No, sometimes these things are updated and I may not know. But if you have the process, it's very easy, and I'll show you on Wednesday how the linear regression works. We'll also create computer-generated graphs, stuff like that. Um, the other thing we're going to do is talk about crystals. Um, crystals is a big part of what we're going to talk about today as well. There's some really cool kind of stuff you can glean out of crystal analysis, like solid states of metals mostly is what we're going to look at. Um, kind of cool. We will go to the lab. Excuse me, we're going to find the density of a metal. Uh, it's not super elaborate or anything like that, but woohoo, first time in lab, so I'm pleased about that anyway. I get excited by stupid things, I know. And then Friday by 9 o'clock, uh, quiz number four will be due, which is kind of gas law stuff. I'll release it Wednesday evening. It should be pretty mellow, same things like that. Questions, any of this kind of stuff? Awesome. All right. This screen right here on the board, and also here on my left hand side on this blackboard, I have an overview of what we're talking about in this section, which are called intermolecular forces. And intermolecular forces are forces between molecules. So as an example, water, H2O, we know now that water, tetrahedral, SB3, oxygen, hydrogen, single bonds, blah, blah, blah. Those oxygen, hydrogen, single bonds are covalent bonds, and those are intramolecular. They're within the molecule itself. Intermolecular, which is what we're talking about, is the forces between water molecules. And these forces are actually pretty important because Ice, all right, if you have a hot day and you want to put some uh, ice in your liquid, that's solid water. On the other hand, if you drink water, like it looks like maybe Jonah has right there, that would be, of course, liquid version of water. And if you heat your water up to make tea, you'll see listine come off. That's the gaseous form of water. And all of those are H2O. They're all tetrahedral, sp3, covalent bonds, single bonds, blah, blah, blah. But the difference between ice, liquid water, and steam is the way that the interactions between the water molecules go. In gases, we're going to assume that gases have no intermolecular forces at all. They're too high energy, they're moving around all the time, nothing's happening. On the other hand, liquids, there is a force, one of these intermolecular forces. And solids have them too. Solids are stronger yet, usually, as we'll see. So uh, last week, Monday, which seems like forever ago, I know, we looked at these forces here on the left-hand side. And notice the arrow, all right? On this diagram, the strongest is at the top and the weakest is at the bottom. And that'll help us later on to predict some of these things. So we talked about the ion dipole force. And the ion dipole is when you have something with a charge. So like Na plus Cl minus ammonium nitrate, these kind of things. Something with a positive or negative charge. 
And dipole means something polar. And water is very polar. Again, it's got that tetrahedral 109 degree angle thing to it. So what happens is the water molecules surround the ion. So for example, the negative ions are surrounded by the positive hydrogens, while the positive ions are surrounded by the more negative oxygens. And they were able to extract, like literally dissolve those solids. So next time you put like salt and water and you see it dissolve, it's actually pretty cool because breaking an ionic bond we're gonna see is tough, but ion dipole force, very, very strong. So when things dissolve in water, it's almost always this ion dipole force, something ionic surrounding by something polar like water. But there's other forms of intermolecular forces too. We talked about dipole, dipole forces. Those are the forces between polar molecules. So anything polar, all that stuff we did back in the early part, anything polar that's a liquid or a solid is going to have a dipole, dipole interaction. And it's pretty strong, all right? Uh, they've usually got measurable uh, polarities. That's a measurable dipole moment. But we also talked about how if you have a hydrogen connected to an O, F, or N, though that's when you have the supercharged hydrogen bonding force. And hydrogen bonding is really important for a lot of things around us. Our DNA is coiled because of these really cool hydrogen bonding interactions. And in biochemistry, you'll learn about alpha helixes and all these kind of things. That's basically all like the supercharged hydrogen bonding stuff. Now, going down to the weaker forces, there's a dipole-induced dipole force. Now, we saw that dipole meant polar. Induced dipole means you have to make something polar that's not normally polar, all right? Normally, nonpolar things are evenly distributed electrons all the way around a molecule. But if you, like, imagine you're a tough guy, you come up to somebody, you know, and, and make him winch a little bit, that's kind of what happens in an induced dipole form. Like, something polar comes up to something nonpolar, like oxygen, and actually makes a little bit of polarity, all right? It's hardly a strong version, but it is something that happens. So we talked about how water comes up to things like O2 and N2, things that don't usually have any polar moment, and it is able to make a little bit of interaction. It allows them to become slightly polar for a small amount of time. So dipole, induced dipole, means you have something polar, the dipole, coming in contact with something nonpolar, something that you need an induced dipole force. This is why oxygen gets in the water, allows the fish to breathe, and all those kind of things. But again, something polar and something nonpolar. And then the weakest of all of the forces has several names, honestly, because it's probably least exciting, I don't know. We're gonna officially call it induced dipole, induced dipole, which just means that you have two things coming together that are nonpolar, and you wanna make some forces on them. Now, ID, ID, which you're welcome to abbreviate, I totally understand, induced dipole, induced dipole, is also called sometimes dispersion or London dispersion, sometimes van der Waals forces, all the same thing, all right? Just means you've got two nonpolar things coming together. So for example, gasoline, if you drove here in a car, a gas-powered car this morning, gasoline is more or less nonpolar, but it's a liquid. So those forces in the liquid, would, we would refer to as induced dipole, induced dipole. It's very weak because you have to make two nonpolar things somehow attract, and that's not easy. You're inducing dipoles on both of them. Now, we're not going to talk about it right now, but we will in a little bit. There's actually one that's stronger than all of these, and that's when you have metals. All right, metals and ionic compounds. The ion ion just means that you've got some kind of ionic compound coming together, making interactions. That's the NaCLs, the NH4Cls, anything with positive and negative charges. Metallic bonds are when you have pure metals, all right? So pure copper, pure sodium, pure mercury, stuff like that. And we're gonna assume that these are even stronger than ion dipoles. It doesn't really fit in this other section, so I apologize for that. But here's kind of the list. So one, induced dipole, induced dipole are the weakest. Dipole, induced dipole are next. 
dipole, dipole, polar, polar is next, unless it has the N, O, or F connected to hydrogen, then it's the supercharged hydrogen bonding. Then you've got ion dipole, which is pretty strong. And then the last but not least, the strongest, is the ion-ion metallic force. And we'll talk more about that today. And again, chemists and us will use these to make predictions to boiling points and why things dissolve easier than other things. There's a lot of interesting little pieces you can do with this stuff. Questions on any of this stuff? So here's a kind of a, well, here's kind of a question you might see, all right? This problem says when potassium chloride dissolves in water, what type of intermolecular bonds are formed, all right? So you have all of the choices that are on the chalkboard here to my left, but you can probably see up here that I intentionally left one exposed. Um, how you can really analyze this is to look at what you have now, potassium chloride, does that involve covalent bonds or ionic bonds? Ionic, uh, good, that's right. Ion bonds are where you have positives and negatives, and usually that means metals and non-metals. So potassium is a metal, chloride is a non-metal. That's gonna be the ionic bonds that come together. If you had water or ammonia or acetone, those are the things that have the covalent bonds. So in this, in this intermolecular forces, this is gonna be some kind of ion-ion or ion something. But it's not just ion-ion by itself because it's in water. Now is water a polar or non-polar compound? Polar, absolutely. And in this context, polar things mean dipole. So we have an ion, we have a dipole. This is going to be the ion-dipole force that allows potassium chloride to dissolve in water. All right? So notice there how I analyzed the species involved. Ion, ion, ionic. Polar means dipole, like water. Ion, dipole. Any questions? Okay, so now that we've talked about the intermolecular forces, we can start thinking about what exactly makes liquids liquids, how to turn liquids to gases or liquids to solids, stuff like that. Now in the last chapter, we looked at gases, all right? We did a lot of PV equals NRT, blah, blah, blah. Liquids are a real interesting phase of most materials too. Now in a liquid, the molecules are constantly moving, all right? As long as you're above zero Kelvin, you're gonna have some kind of movement happening all the time. Liquids do have appreciable intermolecular forces. And why I put that up there is because gases don't really have any intermolecular forces working on them. But liquids, something is holding the liquid molecules together. And those molecules are pretty close, all right? Um, maybe not as close as the solids, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but they are pretty close together. Now liquids, it's very difficult to compress a liquid down. Gases, you can take a huge volume of gas and compress it down to a pretty small volume, all right? But liquids, that's really uh, pretty hard to do. Um, yeah, and finally, if you pour a liquid into a container, it just stays at the bottom. It doesn't go all the way to the top. If you were to pour a gas into a container, the gas would totally fill up the container. It wouldn't just stay at the bottom like liquid does. So liquids are a little bit different, of course, than gases, or as we see here, a little bit solids. According to the kinetic molecular theory, the molecules of a solid are locked in place, though they have motion. Molecules of a liquid are closely associated with each other, but move relative to one another. Molecules of a gas move independently and occupy a much larger volume than those of a corresponding liquid or solid. In Chem 221, I had a couple of you like stand up and you were all solids for a while and everything was rigid, kind of military, I guess, and liquids, you could almost like dance and stuff, but there was still a connection between the liquid molecules and then in gases, everything's off and you just kind of go wherever you want to. So liquids are different than gases and they're certainly different than solids. 
Of these three phases, liquids are the hardest to describe because it's hard to predict all this non-Newtonian movements and stuff like that that people talk about, but we can give some generalizations as to how it is. So even though gases are really difficult to contain, they're actually pretty easy to describe. And solids aren't too bad either. We'll talk about those later today. But any questions on that? Now, when it comes to liquids, we always have to think about how easy or hard it is for them to turn usually into gases, but sometimes solid as well. So two terms I want to introduce right here that I'm sure you've heard before, but we're going to formalize it as chemists. The first one is evaporation, and the second one is condensation. Now evaporation is just taking your liquid and turning it into a gas or a vapor, all right? Condensation is when you take the gas and you make it go back into a liquid. Now, liquids have a lot of intermolecular forces on them, while gases don't have any. So as you go from a liquid to a gas, you have to break all of those intermolecular forces, all right? So imagine my fists here are water molecules, they're liquids, they're kind of moving around. If we want to turn them into a gas, we have to break those intermolecular forces apart. It's not a super high amount of energy. It's not as much as taking, say, the oxygen and hydrogen and breaking those up, but it certainly is something to do. So evaporation, you have to break the intermolecular forces, and that means you're gonna add energy, all right? There's no liquid that spontaneously goes to a gas uh, unless you add energy to it. So it's always endothermic going liquid to gas. And again, endothermic just means you add energy. But conversely, if you go from gases to liquids, now you're remaking those bonds, those intermolecular forces. And you're actually gonna get a little bit of energy out here, because these gas molecules are just going crazy. It's like, take hey, control, constraint, <laughs> all right? You force them to go together. And in the process, their energy is released. So you actually have an exothermic reaction going from gases to liquids. So liquids to gases is called evaporation. It's always endothermic. On the other hand, gases to liquids is called condensation, and that's always exothermic. You're gonna get a little energy out. And again, there are, I don't, I don't usually say this, but I, I know of no exceptions to that, <laughs> all right? Always endothermic gas liquid to gas, always exothermic gas to liquids. <clears throat> now, in a liquid, all right, the surface of the liquid is important as we talk about the transitions from liquids to gases, all right? Because the molecules deep in the liquid are surrounded on all three sides by other liquid molecules. And so for them to go in the gas phase would be really tough. It's the surface layer, which is where the action happens, where the gas liquids become gas. And if they don't have sufficient energy, then you're not gonna break those intermolecular forces and break them happen. So again, having evaporation takes energy. Um, the evaporation almost always occurs at the surface because that's where it's easier to get the liquid molecules turned into gases. Molecules of a liquid have a range of kinetic energies. Some have enough energy to overcome intermolecular forces. If these high energy molecules are at the surface of the liquid, they can escape into the gas phase. This is an endothermic process. If you leave a liquid out in the sun, eventually it all evaporates, goes away, because the sun energy comes in, excites the surface layer of molecules, and they go away, and then finally you use them all up and they're gone. So it's always an endothermic. Now, when we talked about gases, we saw how there was a distribution of gas speeds at any temperature. Some of them were fast and some were slow. And liquids are the same way. And so these are the kind of curves we saw in the gas part last week. Um, lower temperature versus higher temperature liquids have a distribution. The average uh, number of molecules with this energy is here, but there's gonna be some going super fast. On the other hand, as you increase the temperature, then you have more molecules with higher temperatures. 
Um, I put this up here because at any given temperature, some of the molecules will have enough energy to break through and become gases. So imagine this dashed line right here is the amount of energy needed to make liquid molecules turn to gas. And even at lower temperatures, some of the molecules will have enough energy. But as you increase the overall temperature, then you have more of the molecules capable of turning into a gas. Notice though that at this higher temperature, you still have a lot of molecules that don't have the energy to turn into a gas. And this is why if you're at home and you're boiling your water to make tea, the water just doesn't instantly, bam, all go to a gas, all right? It's a slow process. Some of the molecules are ready to rock and roll and turn into a gas, but a lot of them are not. This part here to the left under the red line. Those are the ones that you can pour onto your tea. They're still warm, but they're still liquid. They haven't turned into a gas. So chemists think about these intermolecular forces a lot to see what's happening. Any questions on that? Now, vapor pressure is important when it comes to thinking about how easy it is for liquids to turn to gases. And vapor pressure is literally just a pressure of a gas. So the easiest way I think to describe it is to think about a closed container where you have maybe water down here. And what happens is because you have a range of energies, some of the liquid molecules will be able to turn into a gas. And that gas kind of hovers over the liquid if you have a closed container. If you had an open container, then these gas molecules just go away and eventually everything would evaporate. But in a closed container, you will have some gas over the liquid. And this gas is going to have a pressure, all right? Pressure in atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, millibars, whatever, okay? So in a closed container, you can talk about like an equilibrium vapor pressure. And that just means that the liquid going to a gas has been kind of satiated. Some of the gas molecules will go back to the liquid and some more of the liquids will go back to a gas. So the rate just means that the speed, if you will, of molecules evaporating going from liquid to gas equals the speed of the molecules going from gas to liquid, the condensation. But if we put like a pressure probe into this part right here, then you could actually measure a pressure over that liquid, all right? And this is actually pretty important to understand how the boiling process works that we're gonna see. In a closed container, molecules move back and forth between the liquid and gas phases if the rates of crossover are equivalent, the overall amount of substance in each phase remains constant. The system is said to be in a state of dynamic equilibrium. Cool. So you can see here how some of the liquid molecules, they want to get into the gas phase. They have enough energy, so they go up there. But then some of the gas molecules say, oh, I miss home or whatever. So they go back to the liquid. So you've got this constantly back and forth kind of thing endothermic to go up here, exothermic to go down there, but the rate in a closed system is going to be equal at each other, so you've got like this pressure over. And again, you could measure the pressure up here. It might be a little, it might be a lot, but it will be something that's actually measurable. This is actually pretty important for cigarettes. The liquid in the butane lighter is in dynamic equilibrium with the gaseous butane which has a vapor pressure of about 2.4 atmospheres. When the valve is opened, butane gas escapes from the lighter. The system goes out of equilibrium, and liquid butane rapidly evaporates into the gas phase. When the valve is closed, the system quickly comes to equilibrium again, with the pressure of the butane vapor equal to 2.4 atmospheres. So just say no kids or whatever you want. If you uh, are at a <clears throat> rock concert and you want to get out your cigarette, like woo, -hoo, all right. Uh, anyway, this is what you'll do. And if you look in some of these cigarette lighters, they have like a liquid down there. But of course the flame comes up here. And now we can see why this works. You've got liquid butane, all right. Uh, butane is actually a liquid at this particular pressure and stuff like that but it has a bit of vapor pressure over it. And again, the vapor pressure is just butane as a gas. 
So when you flick this down, the gas starts escaping. The spark makes the butane light up, all right? And you can have your cigarette later. Now, after a while, if you use this a lot, at a rock concert, I'm sure. Anyway, then uh, the gas will stop making a light and you close it and if you let it sit for a while, sometimes you'll have enough to have a little bit more light because the liquid will remake a little bit of gas phase vapor pressure and after a while then you'll have a little bit more of a light left over. So, woohoo, cigarette lighters, chemistry. Questions? Just say no? Okay, good, shut up. Michael. As heat is added to a beaker of water, the vapor pressure of the water increases, thereby increasing the rate of evaporation. If enough heat is added, the vapor pressure of the water equals the atmospheric pressure. At this point, large bubbles of vapor begin to form in the liquid, and the liquid boils. Now the watch pot never boils, and I'm always trying to watch that and when I'm like making pasta or something, and it takes like forever. But you do begin to see bubbles, all right, before the true boiling occurs. And we can understand this now by our understanding of vapor pressure. So this blue line right here is called the vapor pressure curve. And I want to look at this line here. Notice how the line is increasing as the temperature increases. So that just means as temperature goes up, your amount of vapor pressure goes up. And that kind of makes sense based on uh, what we talked about with gases, so P, V equals NRT, i.e. pressure and temperature were proportional to each other. So your temperature goes up and your pressure goes up. <clears throat> now, so when I'm watching for waiting for my pasta to boil, I do start to see some bubbles, all right, because some of them are starting to turn into gases pretty rapidly. But really, you don't see full boiling until the vapor pressure equals or exceeds the atmospheric pressure. Now remember around us all the time, we've got about an atmosphere of pressure, more or less, which is 760 millimeters of mercury. When your vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure, that's when your boiling actually occurs, all right? So in room temperature here in Gresham, Oregon, when you're about one atmosphere, that's what your vapor pressure of your water has to equal before the boiling starts to occur. You'll see little bubbles and stuff like that, but you won't see what's happening. So on this slide, the important part here is that boiling occurs when the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. All right, you won't see full boiling until you get it. Now at one atmosphere of pressure, normal boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. So we now see then how boiling of water at 100 also implies that you have an atmospheric pressure of about one atmosphere. If you don't have a one atmosphere atmospheric pressure, you won't see boiling. We'll talk about how you can make a substance boil by changing this red line, by changing the atmospheric pressure. I get her, I can cook. There we go, mac and cheese. Boil water. What am I, a chemist? So, when, sorry for the American Dad reference, I couldn't resist, but you know, boiling water, what am I, chemist? All right, well, you're of course more than chemist. So, anyway, you now know that boiling then is just when atmospheric pressure and vapor pressure are the same. Questions on any of this besides American Dad, which I really don't know really well. Okay, good. Now, I was embarrassed because my mom one day said, I didn't know that water could boil at different temperatures. So anyway, this next slide is all about getting your water or whatever liquid to boil at different temperatures. In the flask is water heated to about 55 degrees Celsius, well below water's normal boiling point. We use a device to evacuate the air from the flask. The water boils though its temperature remains at around 55 degrees. Some compounds will break down if you get to a certain temperature, we'll say 80 degrees Celsius. And if your compound is in water and you want to get rid of the water, well, you can't just boil the water at 100 degrees because that would then break your compound. So what chemists do is they use some kind of a vacuum, which is what that apparatus was. And by making a vacuum, they lower the atmospheric pressure down 
so the water will boil easier. It doesn't have to get as high of a vapor pressure to make the boiling occur. So you can actually make water boil at literally almost any temperature you want. All right, you just have to change the atmospheric pressure uh, to affect the vapor pressure in order to make that happen. And in chemistry, this is really useful, again, because if you have a compound that will break down at certain temperatures, you can lower the external pressure with some kind of a vacuum system and get rid of your solvent so you have the pure compound left over. Any questions on that? There's lots of fun things you can do with this kind of procedure. Heating the liquid water converts it to a gas, which pushes molecules of air out of the container. The inverted can traps the gaseous H2O when we place the can in cold water. The temperature change converts the gaseous water into liquid water, which occupies a much smaller volume. The can is crushed by the pressure of the atmosphere. So check this out. This is one you can actually do at home. Of course, wear your goggles, kids. But anyway, uh, if you have an empty aluminum can and you put just a little bit of water in, not too much, and you boil then uh, the can, stuff like that. So what happens is the little bit of water that's inside is turned into a gas. Then if you take that can and you invert it so that the hole is now in the water, all right, the water is cold, so all that gas inside shrinks down back to a liquid, which has a lot less volume. And in the process, the external pressure just squishes the can, because remember, pressure is all about molecules pushing on us all the time. Well, now your gas that was inside goes down to a liquid, no more vapor pressure, so the outside pressure just literally squishes the can. This is kind of what happens in science fiction movies when people go outside in space, you know, and ah, they blow up or whatever. Um, it's the difference of external pressure and stuff can really make a big difference. Now, this has huge consequences because a lot of the rail cars that have liquids in them, they have to be super careful if they start to clean them. So let's say we had a real car that has some kind of a liquid, all right? And someone thinks, oh, this car is dirty. I'm going to wash it off real fast with cold water. Well, the cold water on this rail car, which inevitably has a little bit of leftover whatever it was inside that was maybe gaseous, if those th the liquid or the gas inside condenses to a liquid, the cold water then forces then all the atmospheric pressure in, and those things get squished. So this is bad. You'll find some references to this on the internet. It's kind of fascinating and kind of sad at the same time. But again, the idea is, is that if you have a little bit of gas inside, that has its own vapor pressure, all right? And if you cool that gas down to a liquid, all of a sudden the pressure goes down to nothing. There's no more vapor pressure. So the outside pressure squishes your aluminum can or your trailer car in this case, so you have this kind of funky kind of thing going on. Get too excited, I know. Questions on? So this is the vapor curves that we looked at earlier, but now we're looking at three different liquids, all right? We're looking at diethyl ether, ethoxyethane is the fancy name. We're also looking at ethanol and water. Now, we're gonna see that boiling is basically attributed to two things. The molar mass is important, but in this case, the more important part is the types of intermolecular forces. So water has OH bonds, and anytime you have a molecule with an OH, an NH, or an FH bond, that's gonna be hydrogen bonding. And water has actually two OH bonds on it, so water is like supercharged hydrogen bonding going on. <clears throat> now ethanol has an OH as well. It has one OH, so it's also strong. But you can see how water, even though it has less molar mass, less atoms and stuff like that, has a higher boiling point. Those double uh, hydrogen bonds make it super strong. On the other hand, this is diethyl ether. That's an oxygen, and these are both ethyl groups. There's no OH, NH, or FH bonds, so diethyl ether is a normal dipole-dipole force. 
This one is strong, but you can see it's definitely the weakest. It boils quickest. On the other hand, water with its supercharged hydrogen bonds boils at the highest temperature. Now the red line is the vapor pressure curve for diethyl ether. This is the ethanol curve and this is the water curve. And this dashed line right here, this is one atmosphere of pressure. So these are what they call the normal boiling points for these liquids. And a normal boiling point in chemistry jargon just means the pressure, the temp, excuse me, the temperature at which these liquids will boil, assuming you're at one atmosphere of pressure. Now, on the other hand, if you take this pressure and you lower it to 400 millimeters of mercury, then you're going to change all the boiling points. So, for example, at 400 millimeters of mercury, your water will boil probably 85 degrees and your ethanol would boil, say, 65, something like that. So that's why there's a normal boiling point and other boiling points. Normal boiling points are just when they boil, assuming you're at one atmosphere of pressure. If you're not at one atmosphere of pressure, no problem. You can use one of these curves to figure out what it is. So we're used to saying water boils at 100 degrees, and that's fine as long as your pressure is one atmosphere. If you're in Denver, Colorado, the mile high city, your atmospheric pressure is lower, all right? Water does not boil in Denver quite at 100 degrees. It's less than that because this dotted line, the atmospheric pressure, is lower, all right? So when someone says, oh, water boils at 100, now you as the hip chemist know that you can change that if you start changing the pressure. So again, normally diethyl ether boils at 34.6, but you can make that go way down if you start changing the pressure. And same for ethanol and water. Any questions? So all of these curves, which are called vapor pressure curves, they show all the conditions of pressure and temperature where you've got the vapor pressures. Notice that the vapor pressure rises with temperature, all right? So temperature goes left to right, and all of these are getting bigger as the temperature goes up. And that's what you see. As the temperature goes up, you're able to force more of those liquid molecules to go into the gas phase, so all the vapor pressures will go up. And then whenever your vapor pressure equals the external pressure, that's when your boiling will occur. And the normal boiling points are the places where the liquids will boil if you're at one atmosphere of pressure. But again, if you're in Denver, or I think it's La Paz, Bolivia, however that is, the really high area, uh, your, your temperatures will be different than these. They'll be probably lower. Conversely, if you're like in the Dead Sea or, or Death Valley in California where you're below one atmosphere of pressure, when you're below um, L at zero feet elevation, you might have slightly higher boiling points. Those places have slightly higher pressures and stuff usually, so build. Anyway, you can hopefully see that chemists can mess with boiling points. Questions on any of So a normal boiling point is when a compound will boil at one atmosphere of pressure, 760 millimeters of mercury, all right? And as a scientist, as a chemist, that's really important. Some compounds will break up before you get to one atmosphere of pressure, so they'll report a boiling point at a lower pressure, which is fine. Especially in organic chemistry, this is done quite a bit. Now, the vapor pressure of the molecule does depend on the intermolecular forces. Diethyl ether is dipole-dipole. Ethanol has one hydrogen bond site. Water has two hydrogen bond sites. So if you're thinking about the strengths of the forces, like we talked about earlier, the dipole-dipole diethyl ether would be the weakest, and water with multiple hydrogen bonds would be the strongest. And you can see that's how these curves go. The weakest force is the red one, the left. then we got the middle one, the green one, and finally the blue one, water, is the strongest of all. So intermolecular forces will help you to predict which liquid will boil higher and lower. Remember, it's a little bit about the mass too. It's not just intermolecular forces. 
But if you have nothing else to compare, look at the intermolecular forces to see which ones will boil higher than this. Okay, <clears throat> so here's a question you might see. For this question, think about just the intermolecular forces. Don't worry about the molar masses. So if you had to make a predicted order of decreasing boiling points, so that means the highest one would be first and the weakest one would be last, you can look at these possibilities here for some answers. <clears throat> All right. Well, we have methanol, we have methane, and we have hydrogen gas. If you had to make a guess about methanol, all right, what its forces would be, the first thing you'd want to think is, well, is methanol ionic or covalent? So do you think methanol there, CH3OH, is going to have ions in it, or will it be covalent? Covalent, covalent absolutely. These are all nonmetals, CH and O. You could draw a Lewis structure easily after this one. So this is going to be covalent. Is methanol, CH3OH, is that going to be, think, going to be a polar molecule or a nonpolar molecule? Polar. polar, absolutely. Basically, if you see an OH bond, it's almost inevitably polar. This is a tetrahedral slash bent geometry around the oxygen. It's got the two lone pairs on it. This is going to be polar. And polar then means it's at least dipole-dipole. But when it comes to things like we talked about up here, you also have to think about if you have a hydrogen connected to an N, F, or O. Do you think this hydrogen right here is connected to an N, F, or O? Yeah, it, it is. Um, the, if you drew a Lewis structure for it, you would have a CH3 a methyl group. There would be an OH right there. And um, so in the Lewis structure, the oxygen is connected to the hydrogen right here. That means then that you don't have just dipole-dipole, you have hydrogen bonding. So this one's going to be a pretty strong intermolecular force. Questions on that? Now, CH4, carbon has no lone pairs, just hydrogen around it, polar or nonpolar. Nonpolar, that's right. Your carbon is a tetrahedral, like almost always. Everything around it is hydrogen, nonpolar molecule. And H2, like most of the diatomics, when they're the same, they pull evenly on it. That one's going to be nonpolar too. So CH4 and H2 are both going to be that weakest induced dipole, induced dipole. They're nonpolar. They don't have anything polar. They don't have metals. They don't have oxygen, fluorine, and nitrogen connected to hydrogen. CH3OH is going to be the strongest force by far. So in decreasing boiling points, that means this one would have the highest boiling point, the strongest. So we have to have methanol first. So our answer here is going to be A or B. If it's decreasing, strongest goes first. These guys aren't going to be strongest. Methanol is certainly going to be the strongest one. Questions how I got to that. Okay. Now, between these last two, CH4 and H2, they're both nonpolar, they're both induced dipole, induced dipole. So since they're the same force, then what we can look at is how much mass they have, the molar mass of the compounds. So if you added up a carbon and four hydrogens, 12 grams per mole from carbon on the periodic table, plus four times about one for hydrogen on the periodic table. This is 16 grams per mole. Hydrogen, one times two, that would be about two grams per mole. So probably then methane would be harder to boil than hydrogen just because it has more mass. It's harder to throw up in the air, if you will. So we would predict here that methanol would be the highest. Methane, CH4, would be kind of the middle because it is induced dipole, but it has more mass. And H2 would be the weakest of all. Questions? Prof that off. You're at home, you see a question like this, you're like, I have no idea. 
Of course, he could Google none of these things uh, and find out their boiling points from there and highest on the front and lowest at the bottom. But hopefully you can see now that if some students in the hallway says, hey, Russell, which one is higher? You can kind of make predictions as to how this works, and that's what I'm trying to get across. Okay. There's some other things we can do with intermolecular forces too. And one of the other ones we're going to look at here is what's called viscosity. The viscosity of a liquid depends on the strength of its intermolecular forces. Glycerol has relatively strong intermolecular forces and is rather viscous. Its resistance to flow is high. Ethanol, by contrast, has weaker intermolecular forces. It flows easily and has low viscosity. Viscosity is the resistance to flow. And if you've ever seen like some compounds like corn syrup flow very, very slow from a bottle, and other things like, for example, water pour really and viscosity is actually from a lot of different things. But for what we're talking about here, if you have to make a guess, intermolecular forces will tell you how easy it is for them to flow. So this uh, video showed ethanol and glycerol. Ethanol has one OH and glycerol has three OHs. So glycerol will stick together a lot easier than ethanol will. So we would predict then that glycerol would flow slower. It's holding on to each other a little bit more than the ethanol would. Ethanol would be even easier. Now, if you have something like gasoline, all right, which is basically non-polar, induced dipole, induced dipole, we would predict that would flow even easier than these guys because there's hardly any intermolecular forces working on it pieces, all right? It's almost all about intermolecular force. There's other things involved with viscosity, but this is kind of what we'll use for our class. Any questions on Okay. Now, <clears throat> like we said earlier, the liquids on the surface will have a different kind of interaction than the liquids in the interior. The interior molecules, they just kind of, they're surrounded on three, all 360 uh, degrees and stuff, all directions. They can't do a lot, but the outside ones are actually going to be a little bit different because the outside ones are pulled on by the molecules on the XY plane, if you will, and the downward one. And it creates a type of a tension or a force that holds them together. So surface tension is actually something that's kind of cool about liquids. Some molecules have enough surface tension that small objects will actually sit on them. On the other hand, certain compounds won't do this at all. Now, water is very polar. It's got hydrogen bonds up the yin yang. So this has a pretty strong surface tension, all right? If you have like methane or gasoline, it's the nonpolar things, they don't really have this because they don't, the molecules don't connect with each other as well. So things like water will have very strong surface tensions, and there's some environmental reasons why this is super important. A paper clip is placed carefully in water, or rather on it. The metal clip floats because it isn't heavy enough to break the water's surface tension. By adding a small amount of soap, we reduce the water's surface tension. The paper clip sinks. This surface tension is the quality of a liquid that causes the surface layer of that liquid to behave like an elastic sheet. It's the effect that allows insects to walk on water and water drops to hold together. Is 
This is a super high resolution camera. And of course they've slowed it down a ton, but you can actually see like the water droplets like bouncing, all right? They're bouncing because the water has a tension, all right? It's like bouncing into a sheet, all right? Bounce, bounce, bounce. But finally then you get it to the point where it breaks up, all the water comes together, but it's amazing. Now why this is important is because insects will actually be able to float on water. So if you're out at a creek or something like that or lake, you can sometimes see them kind of bouncing around and this is part of the natural eco cycle and stuff like that. You start polluting the water, then you get oil and stuff like that inside. And in the first video, if you add oil, you break the tension of the water. The oil doesn't have the surface tension like the other stuff does. So the poor little insects come along to oil spills, they drown. They go right through it. They can't float on the water and they're used to it. So polluting your water is bad. You know, give a hoot, don't pollute, all that stuff, I know. But anyway, it is kind of important. Again, it's a function of water's ability to have a surface tension. So here's like a possible question. Which of the following do you think would have the strongest surface tension? Well, again, what you want to look for, big surprise, strongest intermolecular forces, basically what we've talked about this whole morning. And if you look at most of these, here's a sulfur hydrogen. Well, that's going to be polar, that's, which is fine. This is an oxygen between carbons. This is diethyl ether, so that's also polar, all right? And these last two are polar as well. But this one right here has an OH. And what kind of intermolecular force does an OH give you? Hydrogen bonding. Good. I saw several of you looking over there, which is cool. And that's one of the supercharged ones. We would predict that the meth ethanol, excuse me there, would have the highest surface tension because it has the highest intermolecular forces. So hopefully you're seeing a lot of the stuff, strongest intermolecular force will be strongest, weakest intermolecular force will be weaker. And one more. Capillary action is a fascinating thing that happens. If you're a red wine drinker, just say no, kids. Sometimes the red wine will go up the sides of the glass. And that's because of these cohesion, adhesive forces and stuff. And in a nutshell, if you have a glass container, all right, glass containers like this one right here, polar things are attracted to glass, all right? Most forms of glass are polar. They're a silicate, silicon oxygen, silicon kind of forces. And they begin to actually climb up. This is what happens with good red wines and stuff. Just so you know, I'm good. 21 in the United States, 19 in Canada. But anyway, they'll actually go up the sides of the thing, which is really cool. So for example, this is what they call a concave kind of meniscus. The meniscus is where the liquid is. And if you look right here, this meniscus has like a dip in it. It's got like a cave, all right? So concave meniscus is this guy? Well, whatever. Anyway, it happens when polar things are in glass. Now on the other hand, here's mercury. We're gonna see that mercury has a whole different type of force interacting. Mercury doesn't really want to be next to the polar glass. It actually bubbles up. There's like a little bulge right there. This is called a convex meniscus. It's trying to get away from the glass. So if you have two liquids together that are similar, they're gonna be attractive. That's what happens right here. They're trying to kind of make connections. But if you have different liquids, mercury would be in a good example. My good old octane gasoline, I've been babbling about this morning. They're gonna try and get away from the liquid. They're gonna make a convex meniscus. Um, if you look at, again, at most regular glasses that you might use at home, they will be concave, like the liquids will rise to the top. On the other hand, if you do have something that's non-polar in a glass container, almost always convex. And one more thing that happens. When a piece of paper is dipped in water, the water moves up the paper by capillary action. The attraction of the water to the surface of the solid paper allows the water to rise against the force of gravity. If you uh, read the newspaper in a paper format and, oh, I spilled my coffee on it or something, all right. Well, the coffee kind of bleeds up the paper and that's due to what's called capillary action. And capillary action is also an intermolecular force phenomenon, all right? Um, most papers have basically polar bonds inside them. 
and water, which is also polar, totally goes up the paper pretty easy. Um, so capillary action is when you have some kind of polar paper in a polar water, and the water molecules literally go up. You can actually separate compounds using capillary action. And there's a fun lab uh, uh, that sometimes we do in our classes where you actually can separate out different metals because some metals will go easily with the water and some of them go very slowly. Capillary action is the name of the game. Any questions? All right, let's take a break. It's about 9.55. We'll start up about 10 o'clock or so. Uh, so take a break, definitely. Stretch your legs. <laughs>